screen and everything look good? Yeah, it's visible from here. Okay, great. All right. And we're getting several chats that are saying the same thing. All right, wonderful. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the prosecutor's fallacy, and this is a probability problem that comes up more often than you'd think. So I'm going to just talk about People versus Collins, which is a very famous case in the 60s that uh, you know, shows a really great, good example of this prosecutor's fallacy. And then we're also going to follow up with a DNA matching um, example. All right. So just a quick bio so you know who I am. Uh, I work for a company called University Training Partners, and I've got uh, a PhD in industrial engineering statistics from Georgia Tech. Um, I was a tenured professor at Southern Poly, which is now Kennesaw State University. I directed their Master's in Quality Assurance program there for eight years. And uh, it's actually, if you're interested in, in knowing more about quality assurance, uh, getting a master's degree, it's, it's a great program, and the master's program is actually all online, so it doesn't matter where you, you live. So you might want to Google MSQA Kennesaw and, and get some more information on that. Okay. Um, I'm an ASQ uh, certified black belt quality engineer and reliability engineer, and I was actually the exam chair for the uh, black belt uh, exam from 2010 to 2012, and uh, just recently I was um, put on the CQE exam committee, so I'm going to be doing that for the next several years. I'm a member of uh, the Savannah section, so I'm, I'm sitting here in South Carolina, actually, and that is where Norval and I met. He was the, uh, the chair, or the section chair of um, Savannah back in the day. And, uh, written a couple books recently. Uh, so the Probability Handbook came out last year, and that is uh, shown right there. It's from ASQ Quality Press, so if you're a member of ASQ, you get oh, pretty much like a 40% discount on the book. Uh, Lean Six Sigma Leadership, and then also um, I've got the Probability Workbook coming out, and that's supposed to be coming out right before the the World Conference in May. As a matter of fact, I just sent the final manuscript to the editor last night, so I'm, you know, relieved. I'm going to have a little bit of my life back, I think, because I've been sitting in a chair 12 hours a day uh, doing the workbook, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so we're going to talk about this famous case, uh, California case, called People versus Collins, and I'll talk about the crime. So in the summer of 1964, Mrs. Juanita Brooks was pushed down in an alleyway by a purse snatcher. And Mrs. Brooks stated that her assailant was a woman of medium build with blonde hair. And a witness around the corner who was uh, standing on his lawn, uh, he, he was alerted by Mrs. Brooks' screams, and he saw a blonde woman with a ponytail running from the alley. The woman jumped into a yellow car driven by a black male with a beard and a mustache. So that's a setup for the crime. A few days later, Janet and Malcolm Collins, who were an interracial couple, they fit the witness's description, they were arrested. Now at trial, the prosecution enlisted the help of an expert witness. He was a mathematics professor who taught at the local college. So he picked up on six alleged characteristics of the perpetrators, you know, as uh, from what the witnesses had said. And, and he estimated probabilities for, for each. Okay, so a black man with a beard, one out of ten. A man with a mustache, one out of four. A white woman with blonde hair, one out of three. Woman with a ponytail, one out of ten. An interracial couple in a car, one out of a thousand. And then a yellow car was one out of ten. Okay? So he estimated those probabilities, presented them on the witness stand. And then he presented an analysis. So he used the multiplication rule for independent events and he calculated the probability of an innocent couple meeting the witness's description. Okay. So the couple uh, probability of 
a couple meeting the criteria, right, given that the couple is innocent, if remember from our probability, this line here, right here, is uh, the given line. So the probability of the couple meeting the criteria, given that they were innocent, he said, was the multiplication of the probability of black man with a beard times the probability of the man with the mustache, white woman with blonde hair, woman with ponytail, probability of interracial couple in a car, and the probability of a yellow car. Okay? Now, if we re remember from our multiplication rule in probability, we've got the probability that A and B. That's what we're trying to find. Okay? So in general, we've got the probability, this would equal the probability of A given B times the probability of B. Okay? Now, if A and B are independent, what this rule kind of converges to is simply the probability of A times the probability of B. Okay? And why is that? Well, if A and B are independent, then knowing that B occurred here in this conditional statement I just underlined, knowing that A and B, if they're independent, knowing what B is doesn't give you any information about A. So the probability of A given B would just be the probability of A. So that's why it all comes out in the wash. So for independent events, whoops, for independent events, multiplication rule it becomes much easier, right? You just multiply each of the pieces. And so that's what he did. So here we have what his multiplication was. So he just did, and remember that these were his, um, his probabilities, black man with a beard, one out of 10, and then, you know, one fourth, one third, and, and so on. And so he has the probability okay, of a couple meeting the criteria, given that they're innocent, okay, is what he calculated, was actually one out of 12 million. Okay, so an infinitesimal uh, probability right, right there. Okay, so the verdict. This extremely small probability, that 1 over 12 million, okay, convinced the jury that the Collinses were guilty. Right? You know, how, how could they not be guilty? So Janet and Malcolm Collins were convicted of the crime. Okay? And this all seems pretty reasonable, doesn't it? You know, you're presented with something that's 1 over 12 million. You go, gosh, you know, uh, they probably did it. Okay, well, they, they appealed. And... Um, the Collins is actually, their conviction was overturned by the California Supreme Court, went all the way up to the Supreme Court in 1968. And here is uh, the, the, the judge's um, decision had this beautiful quote. I mean, it's, it's um, you know, you wish you could write like this. And I'm going to try to incorporate this quote maybe in one of my reports with, with proper attribution. But uh, it's very poetic. Uh, they said, mathematics a veritable sorcerer in our computerized society, which is funny because this is 1968 and they thought they had a computerized society. But anyway, mathematics, a veritable sorcerer, sorcerer in our computerized society, while assisting the trier of fact in the search of truth, must not cast a spell over him. In other words, the court decided that the math that the prosecution used uh, really kind of ob obfuscated the facts and didn't show the truth. Okay? But what a beautiful way to, to write it. Right? Um, so why was the conviction overturned? What exactly was the problem? Okay, what spells were cast right, by this mathematics? Well, the most damning uh, bit of uh, evidence, and, and really they made several mathematical errors, but the, the most important one, the most damning one, was that the prosecution equated the probability of a match to the probability of innocence. Okay? So what they did was they said, okay, if the probability that the couple matches the description given that they're innocent, okay, they said was 1 in over 12 million, they equated that with the probability that the couple's innocent given that they match the description. So we all know that we, if we have the probability of A given B, that does not equal the probability 
of B given A. And it's pretty simple to see that when it's written out. But, you know, when we were talking about, you know, witnesses' descriptions and all these other things, it's kind of hard to, to see the truth. So what they did was they kind of just e equated these two very different probabilities. And so that 1 over 12 million was what convinced the jury. Okay. So this phenomenon where you're kind of saying, oh, probability of A given B is the same thing as probability of B given A, is in general called transposing the conditional. Okay? But in the legal context, it's called the prosecutor's fallacy. And that's the trap that they fell in. So let's kind of explain what this fallacy does. All right? So if I've got the probability that... Uh, oops. If I got the probability a couple matches the description, let's let's kind of set this up a little bit. Okay, so let's just pretend for the time being, for our example here, that we had three couples in the Los Angeles uh, County area who actually matched the witness's description. So we'll just say that we had actually three couples. Uh, only one of those couples was guilty, obviously. So I've got you know a total of three couple, uh, couples that match one actually did the crime, and then that means that two were innocent. And then we're going to say that, okay, I have to come up with how many couples, possible couples, could there be in Los Angeles County back in 1964? And, you know, they don't have to be married couples. They, they could just be two people, right? So the, the case said, well, about 11,300,000, okay? And there's some background on how they came up with that number, all right? So now I've got my, my table here. So for matches the description, I've got three that total that match the description, two uh, couples that are innocent, one's guilty, and then who doesn't match the description? Well, 11,299,997 couples do not, and none of them is guilty because they don't match the description. So the probability that a couple matches the description given that the couple is innocent, right? So if we remember how to do our conditional probability calculations, Okay. Probability of A given B is the probability of A and B divided by whatever is given, which is in this case probability of B. Okay. So we can do that. We can say, okay, the probability of a couple matching the description and a couple is innocent would be 2, okay, all over 11,300,000. And then the probability that a couple is innocent right, would be here, there's 11,299,999 over this. Okay, the 11,300,000s cross out and I'm left with 2 over 11,299,999, okay? Well, that's, that's kind of a lot of work. We can make life a little bit easier on ourselves by using a technique called dividing the universe. So I have my table in front of me, and as soon as I'm given some information, I'm given here that the couple is innocent, then I can ignore the rest of the table and just concentrate on the part that was given. And then once I identify that either row or column, I can pick off the conditional probability right from there. So you can see... If I'm just looking at the innocent column, uh, uh, probably a couple matches of description would just be 2 over 11,299,999. So that is our very small probability. Okay? That given a couple was innocent, that they would actually match that description. Okay? Now, remember that probability of A given B doesn't equal probability of B given A. Let's turn it around. Probability that a couple is innocent given that they match the description, okay, let's use that uh, dividing the universe kind of idea again, if they match the description, that means I only need to look at this one row, okay, and the probability that they are innocent is going to be two-thirds, all right, vastly different um, <laughs> Uh, probabilities right there, right? So the, the takeaway from this is that it's true that it's extremely unlikely that a randomly chosen couple would match a descri the description, right? 
once you do match a description, the probability that you're you're innocent actually goes up by quite a bit, right? So it's extremely unlikely to be put into the pool of suspects. But once you are in that pool, all of a, all of a sudden, say, if we have um, We'll do this. If we have three that are in the pool of sus suspects, so without say R is three, then the probability that uh, a couple is innocent is just R minus one over R. Okay, so two thirds. So completely different. Right? So that is the idea of the fallacy. But there was more uh, prosecut prosecutorial. That's hard to say. Sorcery. Okay, so there were other mathematical mistakes that were made besides just this prosecutor's fallacy. The expert witness that they had, um, they later found out that those match probabilities, the 1 out of 10, 1 out of 4, they were simply guesstimates. He had sat in his office and just came up with stuff off the top of his head. It wasn't based on any sort of demographics. <laughs> Uh, or, you know, census data, nothing like that. So he just kind of made this up, all right? All right, so we're starting out with, you know, probabilities that are just kind of pulled from the air. The second thing is that the characteristics that were identified were not, in fact, independent, right? So, for example, a man with a beard is much more likely to also have a mustache than a man with no beard, right? So when he did his multiplication out, 1 over 10 times 1 over 4 times 1 over 3 and all of that and invoke the multiplication rule for independence, it was incorrect. And the next thing is that um, they only selected the details, these six characteristics, only, only those were selected, and those are the ones that match the characteristics of the Collins couple. <laughs> so instead of going the other way, they had the couple, and then they just matched whatever the witnesses said that matched the Collinses, right? So if, for example, um, the color of clothing was left out of this analysis, and witnesses stated that the, uh, the woman who had stolen the purse was wearing dark clothing, but Janet Collins had worn light colored clothing on the day of the robbery. Well, that didn't get entered into this analysis, only the characteristics that matched the couple. Okay? So because of this, where I'm using um, the multiplication rule for independence and that I'm only picking the stuff that matched the Collinses, this, this match probability was deflated, was a lot less uh, and wouldn't allow other couples who were potential matches to be entered into the pool. Okay, all right. So that was what they found back in 1968. Okay, so this is what the uh, the defense did to dispel the myth. Okay? They used that probability of one over 12 million, and they knew it was low because of what I just said that you know they used the multiplication rule, and also they only included the stuff that would match the Collinses, but they just said, okay, well, we're going to be conservative and we're going to use the 1 over 12 million. That is the probability of a randomly selected couple matching the witness's description. And then they used uh, the number of couples, possible couples, um, of 11 million 300,000. Okay. So then they said, they said, So then they said that um, the probability, they, they kind of used a little bit different argument. They said, given that you found the Collinses, okay, the probability of there being at least one more couple in the Los Angeles area that matches their description, that's what they calculated. So it's given that you found the Collinses, what's the chance of there being at least another couple um, out there that matches? So again, another conditional probability. How do we unravel that? Well, it's a probability that x is greater than or equal to 2 and that x is greater than or equal to 1 divided by the probability whatever was given here, which is x is greater than or equal to 1. Well, if I look at the intersection of, okay, the probability that x is greater than or equal to 2 and it's greater than or equal to 1, that just kind of turns into 
the probability of x is greater than or equal to 2. So now I've got my, my probabilities that I'm going to be set up that I need to calculate. And this is just a binomial distribution. Okay, so look, I've got my p here, probability of a match, and I've got the number of trials or the number of possible couples. So I've got my p and my n, and what I'm going to calculate is the probability that x is greater than or equal to 2, okay, the probability that, it, you know, two or more couples matching the description given uh, that I already found the Collinses. So a probability of x greater than or equal to 2, I have to invoke the complement rule, and that's going to be 1 minus the probability that x is less than or equal to 1, okay? And I'm then going to divide then by the probability that x is greater than or equal to 1. Again, the complement rule is just going to be 1 minus the probability that x equals 0. Okay? So I can go ahead and put this into my formula here, and I've just got 1 minus, okay, what's the probability that x is less than or equal to 1? Well, I'm going to make x equal 0 and get a probability, and then I'm going to let x equal 1 get a probability and add them up. That's what this, this is telling me to do. And so, you know, this is just your plain old binomial distribution formula. I didn't put the n in there, recognize that that n is 11,300,000 because it just kind of blew up the formula and made it hard to, to read. But recognize that n is that big number. So we've got what we have up here and then divide it by uh, 1 minus the probability that x equals 0, which would just kind of reduce to that, right? You do it out the numbers and you get about 40%. Okay? So what the, the defense found that there was a 40% chance that we're, there was at least one other couple out there in the Los Angeles County area that fit the witness's description. A vastly different probability than the prosecutor's original figure, right, of 1 over 12 million. This is why the case got overturned. So I think it's kind of an interesting thing. All right, so that is People versus Collins. It's a very famous case. They use it in law schools to, uh, you know, try to convince lawyers not to, to do something like this. And I think, you know, if you're going to be serious about probability and you're going to be calculating probability, it's kind of a, a nice uh, example to have in your back pocket. Well, let's, let's move on and kind of use the same idea uh, on another example, and this would be a DNA match. Okay? So the scenario here would be, say, a lone gunman has robbed a bank in a small city, and the police have recovered DNA evidence from the crime scene. The city has 1.5 million citizens, and the crime lab, based on the probabilities and, and everything, determines that there are you know, possibly five people in the city who would match that DNA evidence. You know, when they get DNA evidence, it's not like they're, they're mapping your entire genome. It just might be a little snippet of that DNA, so there could be several matches. Right? So one of the people is charged with a crime, so now we've got to answer two very different questions. The first one is, what's the probability that a randomly chosen innocent citizen would match the DNA evidence? And then the second one is, what's the probability that the per a person charged didn't commit the crime, is innocent? Okay. So let's answer each one of these. I've got my table here, and you know I've got a total of 1.5 million citizens. They say that five will match this DNA sample, but only one of them is guilty. Uh, so I've got my, my table here. All right. So what's the probability that a randomly chosen innocent citizen matches the DNA evidence? Okay. So that's the probability that you're a DNA match given that you are innocent. Right. So we can do probability that DNA match and innocent, right? Divided by the probability that you're innocent. So this is doing the uh, conditional probability kind of the long way, and I get four over uh, one million four hundred ninety-nine nine 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 uh, people. All right. I could also use that dividing the universe thing because I already have my table set up. It makes things a lot easier. If I am innocent, then that I only have to look at the innocent column, and I can pick off that probability 4 over 1499999 right away. Okay? So there is an extremely small chance that just a random person you pick off the street is going to be in the pool of um, suspects, right? Very, very small. 
Now we're going to answer the second question. What's the probability that a person charged okay, didn't commit the crime? So that's the probability that somebody is innocent given that they are, in fact, a DNA match. So again, if you're a DNA match, we can divide the uni universe here and say, okay, the probability of innocent right, would be 4 over 5 right there. So there's an 80% chance that if you're in this pool of DNA matches, right, there's five people, there's an 80% chance that you're actually innocent, right? So how would this, uh, you know, work against somebody uh, if they were charged? Well, the prosecutor's fallacy would come into play if the probability of the accused was innocent here if you said that instead of this. Okay, so in other words, it's really hard to get into the pool of suspects. But once you're in that pool of suspects, you know, your probability of being innocent goes up by quite a bit, right? And there we have that. So this again is R minus one over R, where R is the number of people in the suspect pool. So it's a completely different thing. So, uh, you know, that would be the prosecutor's fallacy if the prosecution gave the jury that particular uh, small probability of, hey, this is the probability that that person is innocent. So it's kind of interesting. Right? And it all seems to make sense, except you're not really seeing what's going on behind the scenes where we're doing this as a mistake. And we know that that is not true. Beautiful. Okay. So so in summary, <clears throat> it might be extremely unlikely that a randomly selected citizen makes the suspect list. Right? We've seen that. But once they're on the list, the probability of innocence is actually quite high <laughs> uh, because we're now looking at a completely different pool of people. It's a completely different probability statement. Okay? So we need to be careful not to confuse the probability of A given B and the probability of B given A whether you call it transposing the conditional or the prosecutor's fallacy. So when you're reading through some sort of arguments uh, about you know, doing, taking a particular course of action, make sure that you look at this and make, you know, say, oh, well, wait a minute, are we transposing the conditional? Because it, it's easy to, to happen. Okay? Uh, the probability of a defect given that uh, a part is from line one is not the same thing as the probability that that part is from line one given that it's a defect, right? But it is easy to be confused. And you know, once you point out the error, people will say, well, how, why is that? Keep a simple example in the back of your mind, right? So that you can present that, whether it's the DNA match or whatever it is, and that kind of will jump out to people and say, oh, I see that the, this really is different. Okay, so these are just some tips. All right, so next. Now I've got to do this little shameless plug. Um, like I said, I just turned in the final manuscript last night. I'm very happy about that. Uh, these two examples, the people versus Collins as well as the DNA match, are actually in chapter three of uh, the new book called The Probability Workbook. And it is a companion to the probability handbook. The probability handbook uh, takes people through you know, counting and uh, counting processes and also uh, rules of probability and then discrete distributions and then 15 continuous distributions. So that's the probability handbook that came out last year. But this workbook has more than 430 probability problems okay, based off of the handbook. And they have detailed mathematical solutions and explanations in plain English. Okay? So it's not like you look in the back of the book and it's only the odd problems and it just gives you the answer. And when you get it wrong, you have no idea what you did. Th these are very detailed. Um, solutions and you know everything is in English um, explaining you know why you would do one thing versus the other and that kind of thing. It also comes with a CD with 50 multiple choice questions so if you're trying to check your readiness in terms of probability knowledge uh, if you're going to take the CQE, the green belt exam, the black belt exam, the master black belt or the CRE exam it would be very helpful and like I said it's going to be available on um, in May hopefully before the conference in Charlotte. So my contact info, I am Mary McShane Vaughn, so I am on LinkedIn. If you'd like to uh, send me an invitation, I'd be happy to accept. My email is mvaughn at utp-us.com, and I've got a website 
www.sixsigma.university, which ties into university training partners. Okay, that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, we're ready for questions now. If you have a question that you would like to ask, please type it in the chat box. As we wait for you to type your question in, I'll take a moment to remind everybody that our next webinar is on Tuesday, February the 21st, uh, which will be next week. And that uh, topic is FDA Inspection Trends by Brooke Higgins, Senior Policy Advisor of the FDA. So there is still time to register for that one. We still have uh, plenty of spaces available. Um, if you uh, want to register for it, feel free to do so. Uh, Mary, looks like we've got, let's see, one question. Uh, this is from Emily. How do you okay. recommend how do you recommend a beginner start building probability skills? Ah, okay. Probability is is really tough. And um, I, when I tutored people at Georgia Tech when I was a graduate student, you know, we would have the the stats lab. People would come into the stats lab asking for help, but they never asked for any statistics help. Right? It was always in their probability classes because it was just hard to get your head around. Some of the stuff is counterintuitive. There's all these rules. Uh, and then when you get to the statistics part, it just, some, it just gets a little bit easier. Right? So if you're just starting with probability, I would say get a good book. I would recommend mine. Um, but you need to work lots and lots of problems. And only after that can you kind of you know, convince yourself that these, that these rules really do make logical sense. So it's just a lot of a lot of work in terms of working problem after problem until you know those those skills kind of sink in. There's no shortcut. Oh, I see Chuck's question. Right? Uh, what are some common problems for sampling for defects? Was that the question that just kind of went away? <laughs> I'm sorry, Mary, did you see the question from Chuck? Um, common errors with sampling for defects. Okay. Well, uh, sampling for defects, you know, that's, okay. oops, I don't want to go into my OneNote, sorry about that. Um, sampling is, is tough, right? You need to have a sample that's going to be representative of the population, right? If we knew everything about the population, statisticians wouldn't have jobs and we wouldn't be sampling anything. So there's a lot of different ways to do that. You need to have it uh, being representative, which means if you have several different lines, you might want to do a stratified sample where you're going to be sampling proportionally from each line so you kind of get an idea about um, the population. You could do systematic sampling where you're going to be taking you know, uh, every tenth piece or something like that. Uh, but you just have to remember that if you're calculating things like the probability that uh, you know, there's a defect from line one is different than, you know, doing the, the transpose of that. And when you're saying things, realize that, oh, this is actually a conditional statement. You know, if I'm looking at line one, what's the probability of a defect? And then, but if I'm looking at defect, what's the probability that it's from line one is different. Okay, anybody else have questions for Mary? Thanks, Chuck. Appreciate it. Well, if we don't have any other questions for Mary, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, wrap things up now. Uh, this will be it for today. If uh, like we said before, we will be providing uh, certs for this uh, webinar, your attendance at it today, as well as a link to the survey and a link uh, to the YouTube recording, which we will upload to our YouTube channel here, uh, hopefully later today. Uh, Mary, would it be possible to get a copy of the slide deck? Uh, I. I think so. I, I think I can do that. 
Who should I send okay. it to? You? Uh, you can send it to me. Okay. And then All that right. way, I'll make sure that everybody gets a copy of it, and uh, we should be covered. All right. Wonderful. Okay. Does it look like we have any other questions? Um, we will go ahead and wrap it up then. Uh, next webinar, as mentioned, will be next Tuesday at noon, and we hope to see many of you online at that time. Uh, thanks for joining us, and have a good rest of the day. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Norman. Thanks for inviting me. Bye now.